Hello and welcome to the Ronnie Lever Show, where every week we bring you fascinating guests with inspiring stories of success and overcoming obstacles from the world of sports, business, and entertainment. To support this channel, please subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and hit the like button so that we can deliver you the best content possible. And now, thank you very much and enjoy the show. Let's welcome. He is a trend and future scientist, a TEDx and keynote speaker, a former semi-professional soccer player, a podcaster, a streamer, an author, and numerous times awarded innovation prize winner. And he's going to tell us today about the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with Chris Abale. Woo, woo, woo. Hi, Ronnie. Thanks for having me. Hi, guys. <laughs> Happy to have you. Happy to have you. Wow. Um, that's quite impressive. Uh, how often do you hear actually a joke that somebody tells you, hey, tell me the future? Or, or do you ever get asked to do horoscopes or something? Or how is that? Yeah, of course. Often time. Often. Very often. There's there are always <laughs> the same jokes about where where's this you have this uh can you tell me the numbers of the lottery tomorrow and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well uh <laughs> so if every time you would get an, a a dollar for that or a euro for that, you would probably be a millionaire or something. Yeah, of course, absolutely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> So we've known each other for quite some time. We've known each other for several years and you have a fascinating story. But before you actually get into your story, I would like to know, because it's a very out of ordinary job that you do, what did you actually want to become when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, a professional soccer player. That was my, my dream when I was a kid. Wow. And, and I mean, um, all right professional soccer player i already said that you were semi-professional uh where yes. did you play and, and and what does it mean semi-professional like up to what level how was that yeah um in germany i played it's called landesliga i don't know what is the best translation for that i think at the end it's i think the sixth league or something like that in in austria i played uh, oberliga um, I think it's the fifth or fourth league. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but it's, there's, a, there's a, a huge step from the semi-professional league to the, to the professional leagues, of course. of course. The thing is you have to train also a lot, <laughs> but you don't get that much money. <laughs> so when, when you look back at it, because I think it's it's a dream for for many uh, kids, and uh, it was also one of my dreams, or to become a professional mm. athlete. Um, and and when I look back at it, I think one of the major things why I didn't um, achieve that was that I didn't have the mindset for that as a kid. But but of course you don't know about this when you're a kid. But how, how would you? Now, looking back at your career, what would you say why you did not become a professional soccer player? Um, I had a lot of injuries when I was young. I think that was one thing. But yeah, I, th I think the, the mindset is super important. And to be honest, when I was young, I had so many things in my mind about going out, about um, having fun, girls, all that stuff, you know. And... Um, yeah, I think it was a combination of a lot of things at the end. And I think it's it's also a tough way, you know, and you have to have luck and you have to have, of course, a kind of a talent for it. Um, but at the end, I would say it was also, a co it was really a combination of mindset and, and uh, uh, physiology of my body. I had too many injuries all the time. I've heard some rumors um, that you were really that you were really good in statistics of red cards. Yeah, yeah. So I was all in all the time, you know. So when I'm on the pitch, I, I was never. Um, so I was not a master in training. So I was. That was for me. Okay, that's training is important. Preparation is important, of course. I know, but at the end. Um, when it comes to the game, then you have to deliver. And that was always my focus. And sometimes I, I was 
too much into it, I would say. So at the end of my career... Highly I motivated. <laughs> highly motivated. At the end of my career, I would say my, my red card statistic is better than my... or more impressive than my uh, scorer statistics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what position did you play? I played several positions. When I was younger, I really uh, played at uh, wide, uh, right wing, more in the offense. And then when I um, I was getting older, I, it's the typical scenario. I, I went to the back. At the end, I was a uh, um, um, defense player, central defense, or also in the defense in, of, of the right side. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you know that or if you're aware of that. In ice hockey, actually, there are some teams that actually hire or have some players in their squads that their only job is to come out and beat the other guys up. So if Yeah, the, <laughs> the goons, was right? Job. What's that? Yeah, the, goon, the goons, right? I think they call them goons. <laughs> yeah, 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 I, I, saw, yeah. I, I saw the Netflix documentary, but you're laughing. Um, I don't know. You are the goon. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I was, when I was 13, or f around 15, it, I, I really thought about switching to ice hockey because of the many red cards I got. I was okay. Maybe ice hockey is, ice hockey is, better, ice hockey is better for me. And I, I, I went, so in my hometown in Heilbronn, there's a, quite a good out ice, you need to get there or... <laughs> There, in my hometown is quite a good ice hockey club called uh, Halbronn of Fang, uh, Falken. They're uh, oh. playing on the second uh, uh, league in Germany. And I really went to the training. But they, they also said, sorry, you are too too small and too thin for ice hockey. So, yeah. Reminds me of Happy Gilmore a bit of the, of the movie. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> shifting gears a little bit here. Um, yeah. But uh, but just touching back on on your um, sports background, uh, when you then switched into the business side or into the business mm -hmm. aspect, what actually could you yeah. take with you from what you learned growing up as a kid in, in doing yeah. sports? Teamwork. Teamwork was super important um, when it comes to business and also dealing with pressure. So at the end, at, in the, the, that league I played, we had, I don't know, 1,200 uh, visitors. Yeah, Not that much, but it's at the end, you have, you have this kind of uh, feeling of pressure, you know, and these are two aspects they, they really shaped me until today, I would say. I can deal with it. And also this, this teamwork thing, you know, when you have a group together with so many different characters, um, different mindsets, at the end, you have to, to come, you have to, yeah, to, to look how you can deal with all of the individuals, how you can come together and, and um, yeah, at the end, you have one vision, you know, what you want to reach. And I think that's there in, about this. I really learned a lot during my soccer career. So a common vision, a common goal, and that to bond as a team. And, and since yeah. we're getting asked the question here on, and, on Twitch, and where you're team, from, you're yeah, from Heilbronn, right? Team, yes, and that the team, is, uh, the team is more important than the individual's. That's very important. I mean, when we looked at the Super Bowl, um, the last Super Bowl a few days ago, it was quite expressive how good this team worked together, especially when we look, have a look at the last uh, few seconds of the game. I think that was very impressive. And yeah. Especially the player who actually then uh, knelt down at the one yard line. Basically. Exactly. Having the opportunity to score a touchdown in the Super Bowl is like yeah. uh, for a soccer player to be to be standing in front of the empty goal at the World Cup final. Yeah, but then you sacrifice yourself for the team, not scoring that goal, but to prioritize yeah. the team. Yeah, and that's it's so important. It's it's all about trust and have this common vision, and that's what I really learned from from my soccer career. So 
going back into your, or going to a professional career because you mm -hmm. started out as an IT systems administrator. Yeah. And then um, back, basically went from there, and it was in Germany, to going to Austria and researching about the future. Yeah. What's the connection there? How did that come along? Yeah, yeah. So at the end, I so my big passion was soccer and uh, sports. And this, the second passion was technology and IT. I was really fascinated about it. And then I had a talk. I, I remember that talk when I had with my father. And then he said, well, Marcel, there. I think it will not work with the soccer career. So <laughs> what's your plan for the future? And I said, well, then I'm super interested in IT. And so I started this um, IT career and I really did a, a classical, I didn't study IT. I did a classical, um, what does it mean, Ausbildung? Like uh, an education like, or like, a, like yeah. Um, yeah. Classical educa education, right, yeah, right? And then during this, uh, my IT career, I mean, at the end it was, I worked in the IT area over 10 years. I worked for companies like Fujitsu and Siemens. And um, I moved more and more during the career from classical IT operations and IT consulting to IT innovation. And that was also the time when I then got the offer from Siemens in, uh, in Austria, in Vienna, and I moved to Siemens. There was, it was like... Um, I would say task force in the IT department, especially for innovation projects. So I was part of that task force. And during that time, I... Just a second I, before, let me just actually step in here for a second. Yeah. When you got the call and, and they said, hey, um, you want to come to Vienna and, and basically go mm -hmm. to a different country yeah. from where you grew up, uh, even though it's kind of the same language, uh, I mean, it is both German, yeah, but we're yeah. going to get into that a little bit later. But still, were yeah. you hesitant at the time or were you like, all right, let's do it? Or, or the, were you, where's Vienna? I don't know. I mean, this, <laughs> this, this was a super funny story. Um, once I, I, I decided, okay, I, I would like to do more education. I, I would like to do my master's degree. And then I find um, a possibility to do that uh, master degree um, uh, on site, uh, my normal work. This was a special offer from the Danube University close here to Vienna. And um, um, the IHK, IHK in, in Heilbronn. And it was possible to, um, to do this uh, by site. And I said, oh, wow, that's super interesting. I can do, I can work and I can do my studies. And it, there was it was for two years and it was just okay you can do this in Heilbronn you have just to fly to Vienna I think four times during the two years and then I looked okay where is uh, where's this uh, uh, university okay it's close to Vienna and at that time I, I had a friend who already lived in Vienna and I remember it like today I texted him on it was a Wednesday evening, I texted him via Facebook Messenger and I said, hey, look, there's this chance to make a master and this master is perfect for what we are doing because I know, know him from my studies in Germany. And if he is interesting to do the same and these four courses in Krems, in the Danube University close to Vienna, we can do together. And he said, well, I'm doing so many interns, uh, intern um, education stuff. I have no time. But would you like to move to Vienna? Then you can everything do on site and you don't have to fly this four or six times uh, in that two years. And I said, well, um, let's talk. Why not? And I just sent him my CV. And the next day, his boss called me and said, yeah, you have an interesting CV. Let us talk if it's not interesting to, to, to um, make a change here in your career. And I talked to him and it was nice, 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 interesting talk. And then he said, well, have you ever been to Vienna? And I said, no, I know Austria from snowboarding, 
but uh, more the part in uh, 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 Tyrol. And uh, he said, yeah, well, we book a flight for you. And on Monday, you come to Vienna. We have a talk in person. We have a look at the city and then you can decide. And in my mind was like, okay, never been there. They paying for let's the flight. Just let, let's have a look. I can visit my friends. And I did this and then we... Um, we had a good talk and the next day they already sent me a, a very good offer and for me it was like oh okay wow crazy so from Wednesday evening chatting with a friend uh, on Facebook messenger to Tuesday a few days later hey please come to Vienna it was a, so it was a bit I was a bit overwhelmed and I said okay please guys let me think about it and then I yeah I I talked to my family and friends and the offer was quite good. So really this job at this IT innovation uh, department and they also paid for the, the master. So in Krems, it's a private university. And at the end, I, I said, yeah, yeah, let's do it. At the end, it's two years and then I go back. And yeah, so that's the story. <laughs> so and the two years are still running basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 12 years now, 12. All right, so you, you went to Vienna, you Siemens, uh, but you were still not in the future um, Yeah, so sector exactly. Yet. Yeah. So then I I really deep dived into this IT innovation stuff and um, during that work I I started reading things about the Zukunft Institute, the Future Institute, and about mega trends and about the future. And I already f find it super interesting. So, because the one thing is to look, okay, what kind of innovative products or software products are at the market at the moment, you know, what is common ground at the moment what is common sense, um, what is the, the, the current innovation stuff. And that's interesting, but I found it much more interesting to look in more into the future and say, okay, what, where is it heading to, you know, and what are the big trends that are shaping our future? And I found this super interesting. And um, so I read more and more about uh, mega trends and, and trend developments and yeah then after three years um, when I worked for Siemens I switched to the startup community so I was six years in the startup area and and built two startups and yeah after that I I was like okay what what want what what's the next step and then immediately okay this trend things and mega trends and the uh, Zukunft Institute came, come in, came in my mind. And um, I did once, I don't know, it's also nine, I think eight years ago, I did a TEDx talk in Linz. And during that talk, I, I got connected to one guy from the Zukunft Institute and I, I wrote them an email and said, Hey, look, I'm free. I'm looking for a new job. And let's talk. And so that's the way from this, let's say, I, basic IT innovation sector. All, uh, then in the second phase, this startup uh, technology sector. And then at the end, I finally arrived at all this trend and future um, phase, I would say. What does actually the future mean to you? Because... I think the future has for everybody a different mm -hmm. meaning and, and the future yeah. is not reality yet. And there are always no. a ton of different possible futures, but what is like the future? What does yeah. that mean to you? Yeah, I think what, what is super important to understand that the future does not exist. It never did and it never will. You know, at the end, the future is just a projection in our mind that's and that and this projection our mind is doing all the day air all the day every day um this is this is what you're doing in the present you know so it's it's also not uh, it's also not in the future because um i think that's very important because our mind is doing these protections all the time about the future because this gives gives us safety for our 
um, actions in the present, you know. But so it's more uh, than just entertainment for the mind. Of course, but the, this entertainment is super important. It's super important what kind of entertainment you have up here about the future, because this is as super big influence when it comes to your actions in the present. And at the end, this leads to your future, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. that's all. I mean, you are also a Tony Robbins coach, right? And he's also saying you need a compelling future. And that's why this, this, this entertaining, this, this future, um, future projections, our mind is doing all the time. They're super important to be aware of that. And that is, when we really have to understand that this is the only thing what is ex existing about the future. Mm -hmm. On the LinkedIn profile, it says that you see yourself as a trend scientist and future accomplice with a Swabian hands-on quality, like uh, <laughs> Swabian, like basically the area yeah. in Germany where you come from. And they are known yeah. for basically really being great builders and also at the same time that they are uh, very tight with money. <laughs> um, yeah. But anyway, um, a hands-on quality for who passionately from today's view on the future to innovations and strategies for tomorrow. What yeah. does it mean? How exactly do you help your clients? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, in general, there are a lot of people that talking about the f future on a very, I would say, philosophy area, you know, about they have a very philosophy, philosophy, access to the future, philosophical, exactly. And uh, for me, it's uh, really important. I, I, I really like to talk about the future and trends and mega trends. But at the end, for me, it's really important to, to bring this on the street, you know, um, to, to, to help people, to help organizations to really um, use this, this knowledge of, uh, and power of trends for their own. So at the end, what I'm doing is I help organizations to figure out which of the trends are important for them and why and what they have to do to use these potentials and um, how do I the, the selection is um, what is very important when you look at trends is really to understand what is my purpose what is my identity and where I want to go what is my vision of the future and um, You also see a lot of comparison here to the Tony Robbins stuff. And um, this is a very important trigger for me then to look on the trends and see, okay, which trends are important for these guys, which trend can help them to reach their goals and which trends are important for their business. And so um, put... that's, yeah, sorry. No, no, uh, just putting this into the sports, environment um and then you also already mentioned ice hockey and I'm, i'm sure you're familiar with who wayne gretzky is uh of course wayne gretzky was basically the best ice hockey player who ever lived and he still holds many many records in the nhl the well the best ice hockey league in the world and he said that uh the reason why he was so good is not while other guys were skating to where the puck was he was skating to where the puck was going. Mm. So he was basically anticipating where the puck is in order to then score a yeah. goal, in, in order to do that. And, and I think, what, if I understand correctly, what you're doing is you're helping companies or your clients to anticipate where the puck is going. Exactly, yeah. It's a good story. Can I, can I, can I steal the story? I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's Wayne no, Gretzky's it's, story. You can ask him, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's exactly what you're talking, what you said. It's exactly the point. Uh, it's this, 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 the trend research and all these futuristic stuff hel helps people really to, to anticipate, okay, in which direction are we heading? And then at the end, it's really about, okay, and which trends helps you and which trends um, fits to your identity, fits to your purpose. This is also very important because when you look just on the outside, our society is so super diverse and um, 
you have so many different trends and counter trends. Um, when you look just on the outside, just on the trends, it's super difficult to, to pick the right one because you have so many opportunities, you get overwhelmed. So at the end, it's really more or less to, to look in the inside and say, okay, what is my purpose? What is our purpose? What is my identity and where we want to go? What is our vision of the future? And based on that, you look on the outside and then I can help companies and say, okay, look, there's this, this and that. And this really fits to your company and helps you to head to the and anticipate the, the right possibilities. I like that. And, and let's make it practical also for because the future obviously is coming for everybody. Like if you want it or not, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's going to be here and it's going to be here sooner mm -hmm. than, than we think. And oftentimes we see that things are changing in retrospect. Although mm -hmm. sometimes there are some things that are so elementary in the change that you just, you know that this is going to change the future. So when you think back, for example, uh, when in the 90s, suddenly the cell phones came around and the way how we communicate changed. Then the internet, basically, when it became mainstream, that happened almost at the same time, just a few years later. And, and mm -hmm. suddenly people were getting online and also this changed the communication now globally. Uh, and, and now, just a few months ago, when the first, when, when basically chat GPT, the first real, let's say, AI software that is free, everybody can access it. And it's actually really has a broad use case. And so yeah. suddenly people are being like, wow, this is really going somewhere. And then I just recently read a statistic and maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but some something along the line of uh, in the next or 40% of the, of the jobs that are available today are going to be gone in the next 15 years. That means basically 40%, that's, that's almost half of the people need to, to change their field of work. Like wh where, are we, wh where do you see where we are going in terms of that? And, and also wh where, do, where do people need to pivot to? Um, yeah, it's a super interesting question and um, it's always super interesting. I mean, the whole AI stuff is, we're talking about AI since, I don't know, 20 years, at, at least uh, ten, last 10 years, we're talking a lot of AI and then we have all, always these this tipping points when it comes to, to when the, the let's say the mass people, the mass of the people really understand it. As you said, it, it's an proper use case i really um there was also with all this uh, augmented reality stuff you talked about augmented reality every everybody was like ah oh, yes um okay yeah and then pokemon go came out and everybody understood ah wow okay now i got it and i think what we're seeing with ai is pretty much the same but of course the impact it's 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 much bigger with with chat gtp because now everybody can use it and understands, ah, there is more to this. This is interesting, yeah. And I mean, there are so many studies about, okay, how many uh, jobs will um, uh, will go away. But oh, what kind of jobs do you see impacted? Like, what kind of jobs do you think that are going to be? I mean, the thing is, when you look at ChatGTP, for me, it's it's a little bit like. Um, like you um like you make uh what is teeth kill pizza this um, like a frozen pizza like yeah like a like a frozen pizza for me it's chat should you be a little bit like a frozen pizza you know you can you put it in the oven then you need i don't know 10 minutes you get a nice you get a nice results then you can adapt it a little bit and at the end you have uh you have a good result right um, but it's not compared to to a pizza when you go to a really Italian uh, pizza specialist. Pizzeria, and, uh, La Mamma. Pizzeria, yeah. exactly. There's that's a different that's a that's a different quality, you know. At the end, and I think that's that's what we also see with ChatGTP. So you get really, uh, really, really good um, answers. Um, but at the end. Um, um it's 
I, I, I'm pretty sure the professionals in the in the respective areas, the really good ones, will still keep their jobs. But how I'm long is it going to sure take until until AI catches up with that? Like that, that's is this something? Yeah, are we going to get as good or better? I mean, I mean, what you see, what you what you see right now is that, of course, um, like um, if you are so all the people that. I don't know if you are a graphic designer and you are on, let's say, um, you are not very good. You are, I don't know, on a common level. Um, then you will get problems by this uh, uh, whole technology stuff. For example, um, I did a scenario analysis with two colleagues about the soccer of the future after the World Cup. And we designed four scenarios, right? Four different scenarios. And um, this was not a big publication. We just uh, did it um, and shared it all over LinkedIn. And um, for that four scenarios, I just used DALI E, for example, this generative build uh, picture creator uh, tool. And it was super fine. It was uh, the, the result was really good, to be honest. And um, so it was really, I didn't need any kind of graphic guide to do this. I did it in 10 minutes. It was a, quite a good job. But to be honest, if, um, if it would be a big publication, uh, a book or a big study, of course, I would use a, a really professional graphic designer because it's still a, a different um, quality level. And... Um, I mean, the big question about AI is all the time, okay, when you get this, this general just, intelligence. Just a second. Did you actually, uh, those four scenarios, did you come up with them by yourself or did you ask ChatGPT to do them? Um, the interest, no, we came up uh, uh, by our own. But the funny thing is then I got the offer um, to uh, write a comment um, on uh, sports business uh, IT. I said, hey, write mm -hmm. a comment about it, but just uh, 4,000 letters. And then we attach, we will attach the whole PDF. The whole PDF, I think, was eight slides. And for the summary, for the summary I used ChatGTP. I said, okay, please uh, summarize this, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, I need one hour for the summary. So this was quite cool. Yeah. But wow. the scenarios we built by our own. And um, I think... The, the big question is, and I think that's also um, where you are heading with your question, is when we are getting to this general IE AI intelligence, you know, when we have really a common uh, level of, um, of this yeah, general intelligence. And this is, a, this is a question nobody knows at the end. So when you talk to people in the AI sector, AI sector, they... Uh, make ma money with AI, like Kurzweil and all these guys, they telling, ah, oh, it's 2030 or 2040. Um, but when you talk to um, scientists, um, they work working for um, typical institutes, they are much more step skeptical. So they don't say it's, it will never be possible, but they're really skeptical um, when we reach it and if we reach it. I remember um, because I read several books from Peter Diamandis, and Peter Diamandis yeah. is, is also the founder of the um, of the Singularity University in in San Francisco, yes. and yeah. he's uh, he's really really big on developments and and, and also basically yeah. solving the, the causes for humanity and mm -hmm. like the, the things that are really targeting us. And and what is always really fascinating to me when I read his first book, there was in the early 2010s. I read that he, back then he said that around 2020, it's gonna be, there is going to be the first computer that has the processing power of a single human brain. Mm -hmm. Around 2030, we're going to have the first computer that, is, that has the processing power of all human brains combined. Mm. And this is something when you think about it, I mean, and yeah. even if it's not 2030, even if it's 2035 or 2040, we are still going to be around and, and, and this is just mm. going to keep on growing. Mm. What, what does that mean? Is this something where 
when we need to be scared of or, or frightened of. I mean, people are going to have reactions about that. And, and there have been movies yeah. when, when I think back, The Terminator, for example, yeah, with Skynet. The Terminator, yeah. Yeah, and and so on. I mean, this this was back then uh, some entertainment, but now mm. kind of it's like Skynet has been turned on, mm. or is it? I don't know. So so well, I, I, it's really complicated because when you talk or when you read books like uh, from him or from Kurzweil, they're all really passionate about it and say, yeah, it's twenty thirty and it will gonna happen. But there's also a lot of scientists, they have a complete different view on this. And um, at, the th at the end, I don't know, to be honest. What the, the other guys, the other scientists are saying is that at the, at the moment, um, they don't see a approach how to, we can gener generate this general AI intelligence because we are, at the end, At, at the moment, we are training these AIs with st uh, uh, stuff from the past, you know. It's always stuff from the past. And um, they are just working in a really good... So when, I don't know, it's the typical um, example, they get, you got give them pictures about cancer and they're detecting uh, if, the cancer is, uh, if there's cancer or not, yeah. But the thing is... Um, when there comes up uh, they can't handle novelty you know if they're coming up a new kind of cancer yeah so they they wouldn't detect it how should the ai because he's just learning from from pictures from the past you know and um also when we talk about the robots i mean if you look at the robots from Boston Consulting, it's super impressive. I mean, they, they, I don't know if you know them, but they can dance like ballerinas and stuff like that. It's amazing, yeah? But they, at the end, they're just working in this really um, um, separated uh, environment. You can't put any of this robot and that they can walk uh, through the Maria Hilferstraße here in Vienna. They couldn't handle it, you know? So... What we see at the moment is that all this AI stuff is really working in a in a really um, separated and, and let's say closed um, environments, and um, also the techniques we are using at the moment, um, it's it would be very difficult um, to to reach that level about this this uh, general artificial intelligence and i read a lot of that all the time and the different views and um at the end nobody knows it hundred really exactly when if this is gonna having heaven uh, happening ever and when it's going uh, happening and um i think what but what i really can say at the end um, and that's what we already seeing with all this uh, AI stuff and also autom automation things we are seeing around is, and what is, I think the really good thing is that we humans, um, we, we can and we have to focus more on this, on the um, skills we, we have as a human, like empathy and things like that. <laughs> That's what I wanted to I ask you, because the, what, are the, what are the skills that you actually need? Like, what are the skills that are going to mm -hmm. prepare you for the future? Because as we were saying, like, mm -hmm. maybe if you're in, in, like, writing and so on now, now maybe there is AI taking your part. The same, yeah. for example, if you're a driver, uh, yeah. if, you're, if you're driving around, it's, it's probably not going to be another decade where you can be a, yeah. making a, or a living as a driver. But what are actually the yeah. skills and the things that you You need to have the need to bring mm. it to be fit for the future. So I think so. So my my vision for the future is that there will be always always be the alliance between humans and machines. And also when we look at the, all these um, AI tests, at the end the best tests always are uh, when AI and a human is work uh, a human is wor working together. That are the best. There, they always make the best results, and I think um, so. Of course, what for us humans is very important is this things like empathy. No, never. What a machine will never have. The the AI can could be I don't know hundred times more intelligence than a human, 
but this this empathy this uh resonance this you know the feeling the smells the this 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 the compassion all the things never this is something never a machine will give you and for example when you look at uh, when we talk about healthcare and all the stuff i think it's it's I think it's, it's it's a super cool development if doctors have the support of AIs or nurses have the support of uh, robotics, for example, um, and then they have more time to really um, use their the empathy and use their their human skills because that's really super important when it comes comes to healing. And the second thing is, of course, what is always super important is the curation of all the things, you know. At the end, you have to ask the right question, ChatGPT, you know. You have to uh, write a text for Dali E to create a picture. That's all. And you have then at the end also to curate, curate it and, and bring it in a form for your customer, for your, I don't know, for your employees. And you have to make the translation. And, and therefore, the, this human-to-human -human, um, communication is, is super important, um, especially when it comes to trust. And that's what we talked before. You know, remember when we talked about the teams and the vision. And um, I'm really sure a machine never will give you that 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 feeling. Hmm. That's fascinating. I mean, it's it's. It's very interesting to see also how somehow the machines even learn to um, to to basically to to uh, to take your patterns and then to to uh, imitate them to imitate them and to kind of mm -hmm. imitate human behavior, uh, which mm -hmm. is of course imitated. But it's it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. I want to also ask mm -hmm. you because your mega trends is one of your topics. And you, yes. you once said that megatrends, you see megatrends as an avalanche in slow motion. What yes. are the megatrends you are currently seeing? Yes. So the so at the moment, um, um, the, the Zukunftsinstitute uh, sees 12 megatrends. 12, 12 megatrends for 12, yeah. 12 megatrends. And the thing is... It was the um, three most important ones. The, the three most, uh, of course, connectivity, connectivity. So there's all this uh, generative AI stuff. And, but it's also super interesting, not just that more and more uh, machines getting connected and all that stuff, but based on the possibilities, also more and more people getting connected. That's why the mega trend is called uh, connectivity. And of course, uh, neo ecology. A lot of people would name it sustainability. I'm pretty sure that's the most important um, mega trend for 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 the current decade. And um, or let's put it the other way. I think the most underestimated mega trend for me is silver society. And silver society is um, about that uh, society is getting older and older, especially in the Western area. I, we all know that. So you don't have to be a, a scientist or whatever. You have to just have to look at the statistics. But what a lot of people and especially companies don't understand that, um, of course, there are much more people, uh, old people, but these new old people, they are much more active than in the past. You know, they are much more active. They're much more, they are, um, um, yeah, they're much more active at the end. They do much more things. They're uh, part still participating at events, making world trips and things like that. So they're super fascinating target group because they they have time, they know what they want, and uh, uh, a lot of them have, have money, you know. And so for me, that's the most underestimated mega trend. Because the wow. companies always want the young generation, you know. They always want the generation Y and Z, are oh, they cool with all the TikTok. But there's a really super cool target group, and they say, ah, no, we don't want the old ones. And I don't get this, to be honest. Okay. I have uh, the, the last in-depth question, or I mean, we, we, we are already basically in our in our last five minutes. But what I want to talk about is 
communication and mm -hmm. the, the speed how communication has changed and how we communicate with each other. When you think back in the 1990s, we already touched it. First, cell phones changed the game. Then the yeah. next thing was uh, suddenly you could write a text message. Then the internet blew up with emails yeah. and so on. Uh, and, and everything just developed from there. You can basically now call everywhere around the world for free with videos, yeah. seeing that a person, everything is yeah. instant. It's crazy. And it's we, crazy, yeah. we humans have not adapted in, in the way that we are wired, yeah. that we have been wired yeah. for, for millennia. Where do yeah. you see this going? And, and how, like, what, what's the, the upside? And also, what are the challenges that are facing, yeah. that we are facing? So, that, that's a super question. The, the thing is, what we have to understand each trend has a counter trend. It's always the same. We have a trend, we have a counter trend. And based on that, it's like um, a synthesis. And um, when we look, there's this trend with the digitalization. As you mentioned, communication around the world, video, TikTok, all that thing. And what do you get? Do you know the counter trend? What do you know the counter trend of digitalization? Yeah, all I, this. I, I would say like to just like to disconnect, to just do no, all the yoga what, stuff and so on. Yeah. Like, what What's this. the What's the name for it? I, I'm pretty sure um, you know. The I don't name. know. The the minimal minimalism or or um. It's mindfulness. Mindfulness, the whole, beautiful. Yeah. The whole, the whole, the whole mindfulness um, stuff like yoga, meditation, um, detox seminars, detox holidays. That's the counter trend of the digitalization. Because um, what we seeing is that this, I mean, the possibilities what we have are awesome, right? You you already mentioned the examples, but we also recognized that it's overwhelming us and that's what we also seeing in society that people more and more understand okay the, my phone it's great what i can do with it but when i stare the whole time at videos and tiktoks it makes me crazy you know and that's what we're seeing at the moment that more and more people are going into meditation classes yoga classes all that stuff um, to 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 handle this stuff and to to have a more I would say adult um, access or behavior when it comes to digital technology. Wow! And at the end, um, at the end, what I, what what I would say it's more like what we are facing at the moment is more like such human digital um, approach. You know that we really know. Okay, these things are cool, and we know how when we can use it for a good thing and we also have a good feeling how much is good how much is bad and then we have a much more adult um, um, yeah uh, relationship to it and i think during corona we learned a, a lot about that we learned a lot about hey how cool some uh, zoom calls are we learned a lot uh, how cool is it to also to work uh, remotely we learned what can we do also remotely but we also learned how it sucks to do it all the time remotely right we also we, we yes. also learned how Same. good it is to see other people and that's the, it is amazing the synthesis. It, 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 thank you so much because we're already running it um, out of time here uh where can people find you? Where can people find me? On, on LinkedIn. I'm really active on LinkedIn. I, I, I like LinkedIn. And I have also a YouTube channel with a partner from me, Markus, uh, when we, where we talk about future literacy all the time. It's called Future Tri Zone. And yeah, so LinkedIn and YouTube, I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here on the show with us today. It was such a pleasure to see you and to have you here and to listen to all your fascinating stories. Thank you for sticking with us until the end. To make this content even more valuable for you, please leave a comment below and share your thoughts and also share this video with somebody you care about who absolutely needs to see this. Thank you very much. Have an outstanding day and see you next time.